just as in quantum computers, we can also have superpositions. That's what makes quantum mechanics interesting. So, by the way, one notational confusion that might arise. We've talked about wave functions. So this is a wave function. This represents the state of the particle. It also tells us about the energy, it tells us about the shape of the wave function, it tells us how does this wave function change with time. Everything is inside this description here. That's all you need to know about the particle. How does it change with time? How does it change in position inside space? Now, when we study quantum computing, we actually use a different kind of notation. We use psi1 inside these kets. Now, what's the relationship between these two kinds of notations? So this represents, this also represents the state of the particle. Ket, psi1 ket. Of course, the quantum state. Now, when we write psi1 without the ket sign, it means that with an argument, say x and time, we are actually meaning that we are writing down this state in a certain coordinate system. Say with respect to position, with respect to time. So both of these actually mean the, mean the same thing. It's just that we are representing this quantum state in, in a certain language. We are starting to speak a language, we have an alphabet. The coordinate system is just an alphabet. It describes how you will describe the state. But if I have a vector, so suppose my arm is a vector. This is the uh, tail, this is the tip of the vector. Now this vector exists. Now if you would like to describe this vector, you would like to define a coordinate system. So there's an x-axis, a y-axis, a z-axis. So what you will say is the direction of this vector is given by 3 iota plus 4 j plus 2 k. So now you have a language and you are describing this vector. Someone else might define this to be the x-axis, this to be the y-axis and this to be the z-axis. He or she will come up with a different language, linguistic description of this vector. But the vector remains the same, it still has the same direction pointing in space. So that's the difference between this ket and this wave function. But really they represent the same thing. When you represent a quantum state in a certain language, the language you're talking about is position and time, then it becomes a wave function. Okay? Now we can have superpositions of states. Now we've defined stationary states, we can have superpositions of states as well. For example, I have a state 2 over L sine pi x over L e minus iota e1 t over h bar. This is just the ground state. But who's stopping me from adding to this another wave function? I can have superpositions. I can have the particle in two states at the same time, three states at the same time, a hundred states at the same time. There's no one stopping me from doing that. In fact, quantum mechanics gives you this leverage. This is what real systems are like. Particles can exist in superposition. So to this, I can add another state. I can add 2 over L. Let me add the N equals 2 state. Sine of 2 pi x over L e minus iota e2, e2. Now e2 is actually 4 times e1. So instead of e2, I write 4 times e1. So I have created a superposition of two states. No one stop. No one stop me from doing this. This is a legitimate state. Yes. Sir, जब आपने पहले कहा था, आपने कहा था कि first और second state के अलावा उनके दरमियान में कहीं नहीं हो सकता. तो सर इन दोनों की superposition उसके दरमियान में कहीं नहीं. 
अभी देखते हैं दरमियान का मतलब क्या है दरमियान क्या है ये देखते हैं अभी ठीक है अगले पंद्रह मिनट ये देखते दरमियान वेर इज दिस इलेक्ट्रॉन ओके इज इट वट एनर्जी डज इट है Now, one question that you might ask the mathematically minded students in this class might ask, okay, this is a normalized state. This in itself is a normalized state. The probability of, if I just had this state, the probability of finding this particle inside the well is one. The area under this curve on its own is one. Now I'm just adding these two wave functions. Is that no? I would have to do a proper normalization. I would have to multiply this with one over under root two, and I need to multiply this with one over under root two as well. In other words, I need to do, perform this function. So I have one over under root two of this, and I have one over under root two of this. Just like zero, one over under two zero plus one that normalizes the state. So I have to do proper normalization. I could have one over under root three here. Then I would have two over under root three under root here. Okay, so I need to do a proper normalization. Yes. So how does multiplying one over under two normalize? The... So take this wave function, take the modulus square, integrate, and get one. Okay. Yes. Yes. You are asking some very nice questions. But I don't want to delve into those answers because that's going to confuse everyone. These are orthogonal states. All right. So now we have this superposition. We would like to find out how does it look like? How does it change with time? Okay. So in order to do that, I could plug in different values of time and see what does this look like. Now I can do that on paper or on blackboard, but it's going to take a lot of time. It's, be, it's very tedious, so I'll show you a computer simulation. But the important thing is that I can look at the probability density. <coughs> Let's look at the probability density function. Okay. So if I look at that state, psi. Let me play a trick here. The trick that I'm going to play is this is e1, this is cosine e1. So I can take e is for minus iota e1 t over h by s constant as I can factorize it. So I have e this part minus iota e1 t over h bar. 1 over under root 2, 2 over under root L is also, I can take this as common, sine of pi x over L plus sine of 2 pi x over L e raised power minus iota. 4e1 minus e1, which is 3e1. <coughs> so what's the difference between the first excited, first excited state and the ground state? It's 4e1 minus e1. 3e1. So I can instead of that 3e1, let me write delta e, which is the gap between the first excited state and the ground state. So this is my wave function. This is a global phase factor, it doesn't really matter when I compute probability densities. So I need to compute the complex conjugate of this factor and then I will find out a probability density function. Okay, so I take this factor over here. So I ignore this because if I take the complex conjugate of this and multiply it with this, I just get 1. This becomes 1 over L Now what I need to do is I need sine of 
pi x over L plus sine of 2 pi x over L E plus iota delta E T over H bar multiplied with sine pi x over L plus sine 2 pi x over L E minus iota delta E T over H bar. Okay, I've taken the, yes. So why uh, won't I, T, and H bar go out in the common sense? Why? Because we've taken the common. Yeah, they have taken out in the common, but we have four on the other side. So we just subtract one, we left with three times E1. Three times E1 is just the gap. This is E4 minus E1. Sorry, E2 minus E1. But what about I and T? Yes, sir. I, T, this is I think this is correct. So now I have this property density function, I just multiply out the terms. Okay? So I sine square pi x, sine pi x multiplied with this, sine 2 pi x multiplied with this, this. So I will get a time dependent probability density function. The probability density function is now going to change with time. Okay? And I'll find out that that probability density function, do, go, go home and do this on your own. You'll find out that this probability is now going to change with the frequency delta E over H bar. Whatever the gap between those energy levels is, that will be the oscillation frequency of this probability density function. So the probability density function is now changing with time. It's a transient. It's no longer stationary. Because we have composed the superposition of states, the probability density also changes with time. Okay, you can actually do the multiply out these two terms and you get something really interesting. So let me show this in, in a simulation form. Yes. Yes. Probability density function that changes with time.
Okay? So no longer is it a nice wave. It, it doesn't look nice at all, but it's a legitimate wave function. It has nodes at the walls, which is a requirement. And the next thing that you would see is that it also has nodes here. Two additional nodes inside the well. Yes. A3 ko mein kam kar Zero kar. Okay. Now what we would like to do is we would like to see how does this wave function change with time. There's a real part to it, there's an imaginary part to it. Here the imaginary part is zero. This is the probability density function now. The probability density function has become more skewed. It's no longer nice symmetric, it has skewed. It's rather asymmetric inside the well. There's a high probability density of finding this particle between zero and points 6.5 of the length of the well. But then you will see that this hump is going to change its position with time. Let's see how the time dynamics pan out. I created a superposition and this is what's happening with time. With a certain frequency which is equal to the energy gap between the ground and the excited states, this hump is shifting from the left to the right end of the wall, of the well. It's shifting, it's oscillating. Now we have a probability density function that is oscillating with time inside the well. Now depending upon when you measure, when you measure, there's a different likelihood that the particle will appear in different places. If you time your measurement, so that you're always hitting or synchronize your measurement so that you're always hitting when the particle is on the left of the well. You always find the particle to be there. By the way, you need multiple copies of the particle because you're going to destroy the particle once you look at it. But nevertheless, the probability density function is now changing with time. It's oscillating inside the well and the frequency with which it oscillates. Frequency means what's the time period of this oscillation is found out to be equal to the gap energy gap. Now the question that which student asked is where is the electron? The electron is still inside the well but now its probability density is oscillating. It's and what's the energy of the particle? Well you can't say. If you measure this wave function at some point in time you collapse the wave function into either this or this you create a new wave function. So there is some probability that you'll find the energy to be E1 and there is some probability that you'll find the energy to be E2 or 4E1 and that depends upon when you are making a measurement. So your observation is now time dependent because you have a superposition. You can create arbitrary superpositions. If I add to this, I bleed through another term which is the second excited state which I'm going to do by in, in incrementing this A3. Now I have a more complicated time oscillation. All right, I can actually have really nice states. If I create a superposition of states, in such a way I can also have wave packets. I can also have different kinds of functions oscillating with time inside this well. So this is the time dynamics of a superposition state. I can also have coherent states. Uh, I, I, I'll, do that in a, I'll do that later in the class, but let's move on. <coughs> Any questions about this? Any questions? You really need to be comfortable with this, yes. It's not similar. It's Fourier transform is a is an important concept, but it's not similar. I think yes. If we have two waves that are or how can how can sort of they affect the other in terms of their probability? Because they are or 
No, orthogonal means that if you have one state and you try to measure the particle to be in the other state, you'll get zero probability. But orthogonal states, you can create superpositions of orthogonal states. That's possible. You have zero plus one in quantum computers. These are orthog zero and one are orthogonal states, but you can create superpositions of them. So, in a let's look at the block sphere picture. In the block sphere picture, one of the states is labeled zero. The orthogonal state is labeled one. But can't I have a superposition of states? Yes, indeed I can. I can have zero plus one under root two. And that state is represented by a state on the equatorial plane. So this is indeed a superposition of states. Okay? And now what's the energy of this state in this context? As I've mentioned, when you measure this state, it's either going to be E1 or E2. Yes? Sir, if you have the same copies, if you measure one, it will be E2 and the other one will be E1. With certain probabilities. So sir, the energy difference of this particle has extra energy? If it's E1, it can be E1. Somehow we have created this energy. Somehow we put in some energy. So light is coming in. And that electron is now in a superposition of both states. So we have we are bathing that atom or that particular well with external energy so that we are creating a superposition. We have to create the superposition when, somehow. When you measure the particle or go E1 pe a jata, so where did that energy go? Uh, I don't understand your question, please. जब अगर हम पार्टिकल मेजर करते हैं वो E2 पे भी आ सकता है E1 पे भी आ सकता है, राइट? तो अगर अगर वो फॉर एग्जांपल एक दफा E2 पे है तो इसका मतलब देर इस एनर्जी इन देर डेट इस इक्वल टू E2। पर अगर हम दूसरी दफा मेजर करते हैं वो E1 पे आता है, तो वो वाली एनर्जी कहाँ गई जो E1 से ज़्यादा थी? When you have a state of this kind, I would like you to find out the energy. You cannot find out the energy unless you make a measurement. But suppose you have this state, you would like to find out the spread in energy. There will be large spread in energy. The energy is E1 or 4E1. So the conservation of energy applies outside the domains of the uncertainty principle. Within the domains of the uncertainty principle, there is a spread in the energy. So conservation of energy applies within the constraints of the uncertainty principle. Okay? So the energy is uncertain to begin with. So what if we superimpose E1 and let's say E9? The energy is so much. Right, so the spread in energy is really large. So within that large spread in the energy, the energy is indeed conserved, but not outside it. <laughs> Alright, more questions? Because we're going to look at something more interesting. Yes? Speak up, some logo some of that. Yes. So you just take this state, sine pi x, take sine 2 pi x, so multiply them, integrate with respect to x, from 0 to L you get 0. Okay? You can prove it mathematically. But I don't want to do all proofs here because this is meant to excite you about quantum mechanics, not to make you proficient with it. Anyway. Now the next point is something really interesting. Let's talk about what we deal with our, in our lives on a daily basis and we need to surmount these. We need to tackle these and these are called obstacles. How do we deal with obstacles in life? Or how does a particle deal with obstacles in quantum mechanics? For example, you have water here and light comes in from air and hits this, this surface of water. This could be a single photon coming in by the way. It could be quantum light. A single photon comes in and sees a barrier, sees an obstacle. 
because its medium has changed. It was in vacuum and now it's in water. It sees an obstacle. How does it respond? From classical theory, we know that it can either be reflected or it could be transmitted. But how does quantum mechanics come to our rescue? How does quantum mechanics deal with situation of this kind? A free particle is coming in and it sees an obstacle. The real exciting stuff happens at obstacles. If life were symmetric, if the universe was symmetric and there was no breakage of symmetry, life would not be interesting at all. So it's really important to understand at obstacles. We look at infinite wells. What happens if the well is not infinite? What happens if the well is sloping in, in its shift? Now let's come up with an example. In order to concretize this idea, let's look at the potential landscape which has a step in it. Which means that the particle is free, the potential energy is zero in a certain region of space. At x equals zero, the potential energy suddenly changes. And there is a step in the potential energy. The potential energy goes up. Just, excuse me, are you in the class? There's no reason to smile, by the way. So by the way, a particle comes in, it's in vacuum. There's no force acting on the particle. The potential energy is zero. Suddenly, there's a step in the potential. The potential energy goes up. It's just like an electron wandering in space, and it enters a region instantaneously, instantly, where the potential energy goes up, which means it sees an electric potential, a negative potential. It sees some negative charges nearby which are increasing its potential energy. And it happens suddenly, so there's an abrupt change in the potential energy of the particle. Okay? Now, suppose this potential energy here is zero. The potential energy takes a positive hit. It becomes V0. So now there are two regions. There are two mediums, in other words, for the particle. Now we would like quantum mechanics to help us. We would like Dr. Erwin Schrodinger to help us. Now how is he going to help us? He's given us an equation. Now it's up to Mr. Sulman and it's up to Mr. Talha and it's up to Mrs. Nasreen, Miss Nasreen to actually come up with an argument which actually describes this phenomenon. Okay? Now how do we do that? Now suppose that the particle is coming in from your left. So in this region, the particle is behaving like a free particle. Okay? And the free particle, we know what the wave function of that free particle is. It's A E I K X. K is some wave number. But before that, let me back off a little bit. We would like the particle to have some energy as well. We know that if this energy of the particle, as it's in this free region and it encounters this obstacle, if this energy is larger than this potential gap, this potential energy, then it will actually go into this region. So if the energy of this particle lies here, it's bigger than this potential energy. E is bigger than the potential energy, you can expect the particle to go in positive x region. This region is no longer forbidden for the particle because it has enough energy to overcome this obstacle. Agree? All right. So let's look at this scenario. In this region, in the negative x region, where the potential energy is zero, the particle is actually behaving like a free particle. So its wave function in this region is given by A E I K X plus B E minus I K X.
all right? Now we're looking at a time-independent wave function, which means with each wave function, there is an e raised from minus iota omega t factor as well. Now what does this wave function represent? We've already seen that this factor represents a wave that is propagating to the right, and this represents a wave that is propagating to the left. In this region, why, now let me go a bit further in my argument and pose the following question. If a particle comes in and sees an obstacle, there is some probability that it will be transmitted into the other medium, this transmission, and there is some probability that it might change its course and come back. It doesn't like the obstacle and it's reflected. So there are two possibilities for the particle that is inside this negative x region. So I have two terms inside my wave function. And these, this solves the Schrodinger equation. We've already seen it. This term also solves the Schrodinger equation. We've already seen it. Right? So both of these terms, when you add them up, they will also solve the Schrodinger equation. Now in this region, the particle, once it has entered the other medium, it, it can keep on moving straight, but there is no other obstacle that it sees. <coughs> so, beyond this region, the wave function is C E I K X. But there is no backward propagating term because there is nothing beyond this region where this particle, which has once entered this region, could be reflected. So there's only transmission here. So there is an ongoing wave, a forward progressing wave. By the way, these are not standing waves we're talking about because this system is not bounds. These are traveling waves. So inside this region, this is the wave function. Inside this region, this is the wave function. All right? So this is our starting point for, for our discussion. Now the question is, what about these k's? Inside this region, there is no re reason why this k should be different from this k. So these k's are the same. Okay, k is just a wave number. If, if you have a medium and the wave is propagating in one direction inside the wave and the medium same medium, the wave is propagating in the opposite direction, the speed of light doesn't change, the refractive index doesn't change. K is still the same, going forward or coming backward. So these Ks are the same. But what about this K? We'll have to find out because the potential energy inside this region is different. There is a possibility that this K is different. So let me put a K2 here. <coughs> And let me put a K1 here. So I put K1s here and I put a K2 here. <coughs> now what I would like to do, I would like to find out these constants and how, how does everything match up. First of all, I would like to find out the Ks so that I can plot the wave function. Okay, I like to find out the Ks. Now if I look at the Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation tells me what the k's are going to be. Can you quickly tell me what this k is going to be? It's 2 me over h bar under root, h bar squared under root. So this k1 is 2 me over h bar squared under root, or 2 me over h bar. Now I need to find out this k2. Here, I have to solve the Schrodinger equation again because my potential energy is no longer zero. So let me add the potential energy term to the Schrodinger equation and solve it. So in this region, if I write down the Schrodinger equation, minus h bar squared 2m d squared psi x dx squared, now I have 
have a V. Inside this region, what is V? It's V naught. And what's the energy of the particle? It's still E. Now I would like to solve this equation. When I put this thing equal to zero, that's what we've done previously in the infinite well for the free particle. K turns out to be equal to this thing. Now we have this extra term. So we have to be extra cautious. Let's factor this term in. So we want to solve this differential equation. So what I would like to do, I would like to multiply both sides by, so I would like to make the coefficient pair one, in other words, so that I simplify the equation. So if I would like to make the coefficient here go to one, I just write d squared psi dx squared minus 2m v naught or h bar squared psi equals minus 2m p h bar square psi. That's all I've done. Some manipulation algebra. Now we've already learned some techniques of solving the differential and just one technique. You don't need to remember much. Good to apply that technique. That's all we'd like to do. All right, are you okay with this? Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this thing to the other side of the equation. Manageable. 
Okay? So now I have plus iota of a positive number and I have minus iota of a positive number. Okay? So now my I can write down my wave function. My wave function will be inside this region will be c times e one of the roots which is plus iota I call all of this k2 k2 x Now my K2 is a positive number over here. It's this number. Plus D times E minus I, the other root, which is minus K2X. So that's the solution to the Schrodinger equation inside beyond the obstacle. Now I've already argued that this term is zero. So mathematics gives me this solution. Now I use my physical insight to tell me that this D has to be zero because there is no backward propagating wave. So now I have C times I K to X beyond the obstacle. I have found out the value of K2. Now how does K1 compare with K2? Let me write down these things over. And so my K1 I would like to preserve this thing here.
here k2 is short bit smaller wavelength is longer this is what the wave function a sketch of the real part or the imaginary part of the wave function is going to look like wherever the gap between the energy so the energy is somewhere here it's beyond v naught it's bigger than v naught so this obstacle is only an obstacle it's not a barrier it's it falls short of becoming a barrier it does not have the capability to stop the particle some of the particles some with some probability it's reflected and with some probability it's transmitted but at this interface there is an interface this, this this could be air this could be water at this interface the wavelength changes and when the wavelength changes the speed changes p as you all know is given by h bar k k is large here which means the momentum of this particle is large here which means if you talk about classical particle the speed of the particle is large in this region k is smaller p the momentum is smaller the speed is consequently smaller and this also makes sense if the gap between the energy and the this is like frictional this is like frictional force viscous drag on the particle now this there is some viscosity here to the particle the quantum viscosity because of this quantum viscosity the particle is is expending some of its energy in overcoming the viscosity so the residual speed and momentum of the particle go down this is what happens in an obstacle now the really counterintuitive thing let me finish the really counterintuitive thing happens here if this is my obstacle and the obstacle is large enough that the energy of the particle falls short of the obstacle height so quantum mechanically or uh, classically the particle cannot enter this region all of it has to be deflected but quantum mechanically that's not the case some of the particle can actually go into this classically forbidden region because this is not an infinite wall if it were an infinite wall all of it would be reflected but now this is a finite obstacle or a finite barrier the energy is smaller than this v not so here the wave function still remains the same nothing happens to the wave function here it's still a e i k1 x plus b e minus i k1 x in the next lecture we will actually compute these coefficients nevertheless but beyond this obstacle now what's going to happen now something strange is happening the strange thing is that now this object this object e minus v is negative so now you have plus minus iota of the square root of a negative number now what's the square root of a negative number it's iota times something so you have plus minus iota times iota all right so let me okay so let's let's look at this number here
plus minus iota. These are my rules. Now E minus V naught is negative. V minus V naught minus E will be positive. So let me write this thing as plus minus iota minus 2m v0 minus e over h bar. So the square root of minus 1 is iota. That iota comes out. This becomes iota squared minus 1. So I get plus minus iota squared. So this is a plus minus, so I get just 1 here. Now I have 2m v0 minus e h bar. Now is this a positive number? Yes. yes. Let's call it alpha. Some positive number, alpha. So I have plus minus alpha. <coughs> now alpha, remember, is a positive number. So now my solution inside this region is going to be c times e plus, now I don't have an iota sign here. I don't have an iota, I just have plus alpha and I have this is my wave function inside this viscous region. <coughs> now comes in the physics. My wave function is such that it can never go to infinity because that's meaningless. An infinite wave function means an infinite probability density, which is just meaningless. So my wave function has to remain like a nice, reliable, regular kind of function. It cannot blow up to infinity. It has to be finite. But inside this region, if I increase my value of x, a wave function should go down, 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 down. I cannot have a wave function that keeps on increasing. That's unphysical. Therefore, this function cannot exist, which means c must be 0. Because if I increase x, this is a positive number. If I plot x versus e, this for alpha x, this is just a function that exponentially grows. It keeps on building up and up. But this is unphysical because you have a particle coming in, it's being reflected from a barrier, and on the other side, it just grows, the probability density grows up as you go away. This is unphysical. Okay? So this term is zero. So the wave function on the other side must be given by this function. Now is this oscillatory? Is this waving? No, because it doesn't have an iota here. This is just an exponentially decaying function. And what does an exponentially decaying function look like? I have some wave function here, some k, which is this k1, inside this region, the wave function now decays exponentially. It goes down and quickly approaches zero. So there is some finite likelihood, so it seems, of locating the particle beyond the classically forbidden region. Here, because this wave function is non-zero here. So the wave function has actually penetrated into the classically forbidden region. And how much has it penetrated? It has penetrated by 1 over alpha. The penetration length is 1 over alpha. This alpha tells you the strength of penetration. So, If I would like to plot e raised for minus 2x versus e raised for minus 3x. So e raised for minus 2x goes down like this. And e minus 3x will actually go down in a steeper fashion. It will decay rapidly because this 3 is larger, which means if alpha is large, alpha is large means v naught is, is bigger and bigger 
than E. So if V0 is much larger than the energy of the incoming particle, the wave function decays more rapidly as it should. If the barrier height is larger than the energy of the incoming particle, the decay is faster and faster and faster. But on this point, the wave function remains continuous. It always remains continuous because the wave function must be continuous. And so there's a penetration length. So if I have a decaying wave function, e raised to the minus alpha x, I can find out the length over which this exponent decays to some value. Conventionally, I would like to see where does this exponent decay to 37% of its value. This is given by 1 over alpha. If I put x equals 1 over alpha, I get e raised to the minus 1, which is 0.37. So, 1 over alpha is the measure of the penetration length. Bigger is alpha, which means bigger is V0 from E, shorter will be the penetration length. Alright? So there is a finite probability, there might appear to be a finite probability of locating the particle. But if you are an experimenter, last thing, if you are an experimenter and you say, oh, quantum mechanics is great, it's magical. So this is an obstacle and I would like to find out the particle here. So there is some finite probability of locating the particle in the in, in this classically forbidden region. So what's the probability of locating the particle here? Now the point is that no experiment can ever tell that the particle exists here because this penetration length is small. This penetration length is small, the energy of the uncertainty in the energy goes higher and higher. So even though the particle has a finite wavelength here, any attempts of actually locating the particle here will be met with severe resistance because of the uncertainty principle. So, so this is slightly problematic. However, if you have a well, a barrier, that is of finite width. If you have a barrier of this kind, and the energy of the particle is smaller than the height of this barrier, then you can have a wave function which decays, and then you find a finite wave function on the other side. This is called quantum mechanical tunneling. And we look at quantum mechanical tunneling in the next lecture. One last announcement. I had office hours today from 10 to 11, but I have to go for a meeting, so I'll be available after lunchtime till 5 or 6 p.m. Thank you.